right, it's working. I, I don't think we actually need it if we don't have time here. <laughs> but, um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this workshop. My name is Annie Luo, and I'm here with my teammate Rachel Cates from the World Economic Forum. I, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today, and it's really uh, very exciting to be here at the Internet, Gov Internet Governance Forum. So this workshop called Norms and Values in Digital Media is in fact part of a project the World Economic Forum has taken on for the past year and a half. Uh, in the, for this project, we wanted to look at the emerging norms and values on the internet today. We have impacted critical infrastructure, <laughs> privacy, intellectual property, and freedom of expression online. Uh, what do we have done in the first year to really have a global conversation? We went to places such as India, Turkey, Brussels, and Davos to really try to understand what's working, what's not, and what are the unintended consequences. And for the second year, we have focused so far on intellectual property in the digital age. And some of the questions have arisen along the way. Um, is copyright set? Is it relevant? What is the value of digital content today? Is it purely monetary? Is it recognition also a form of value? And how do you incentivize and encourage content creation? And how do you stimulate creativity in our day and age? So along with these questions, I think we, we, we would like to introduce our moderator and, and the panelists. Um, Kathleen Ream from the Engineer is going to moderate this session for us. And I would like to hand it over to her. And she will take us through the, the hour and a half of hopefully very stimulating and exciting conversation. Thank you very much, Annie, and uh, it's, it's an honor to have this opportunity. One of the really exciting things I think about this panel is that you're about to hear a real diverse range of voices in this issue, which is emblematic of some of the really big challenges that um, lie ahead, and some of the core disputes and debates and ideas that are coming back to this very very So without further ado, um, I'll introduce first of all uh, Andre Guadamu, who is a senior lecturer in intellectual property law at the University of Texas. David Farris, who is SCP for Government Affairs at the 21st Century Fox, based in London. Shinta Nugrofo, who is head of public policy with Google in Indonesia. And Andrew Putifat, further to my left here, who is executive director for Global Partners Digital in the UK. Sarah Wynne Williams, who is with the Global Public Policy team for Facebook based in the US, and Shinto, oh sorry, and Ari Giuliano Gemma, who's the project director for Creative Commons in Indonesia. We thought that it might be helpful to have each of these different panelists uh, share with you their introductory remarks so that we can then get into a discussion and a debate uh, on this exciting issue of uh, norms and values in digital media and uh, what it means for IP and creativity online. So we'll start right up the end here. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It just uh, I usually start my uh, talks or forums or presentations uh, often with an apology. Uh, if I'm rambling or incoherent at some point, it's because uh, jet lag has hit me really hard this afternoon. So, uh, um, I am delighted to be in, in this panel. Uh, for several reasons, I think uh, we've been looking, uh, or we're going to be looking at uh, creativity and the creative industries and the creative process and the values of what it means in the digital age. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to provide a more broad approach that than sometimes narrow uh, narrative of, uh, of creators as a very small group of, of, of people and also uh, think of the value of what it means to create and the value obtained from creation in a much broader sense, which is what my, my perspective is going to be. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation to participate. I'm a, I'm a late, late addition, and it's a, I'm very glad that you have asked that someone from the content industry to be on the panel, because I think our perspective is very important to the discussion. Um, of course, I will take the perspective of a company who is engaged in the production of professional content. Um, from a film industry perspective, I would say that uh, 
you know, it's a very risky investment to make a film. Seven out of ten films lose money. What, is it, what do we do? We create content that consumers want, and we distribute that content across a whole host of different platforms. And copyright is the means by which we both create the content and distribute the content. So it's fundamental to what we do. But so is freedom of expression. Because if we want to be able to produce the content that challenges governments, that educates users, that entertains users, and informs users, we need to have the ability to choose what content is, what, what content would actually attract the consumers. There's often a false tension made between copyright and freedom of expression, and I believe they're mutually, exp yeah. mutually reinforcing and mutually beneficial. There's also sometimes a dichotomy made between content creators and internet platforms. And again, I think they're mutually reinforcing because we create the content and we need the intermediaries to distribute that content for us. Um, and I, when, when we get to the questions and answers, I will actually provide some, some, some statistics and some information that will help back up uh, these introductory remarks. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm Shinto Nagroho from Indonesia, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I think this is really interesting. Um, opportunity and um, a great place to actually share uh, some of our experience. Um, as you know, for, for Google, this is especially relevant because as, as David um, talking about how expensive it is to create one content, actually our experience with YouTube, for example, is enable those that would not have any access to the capital to start creating new content, which basically equalize the opportunity for everybody that uh, wouldn't be uh, possible before. Um, and I will, as, as we go along in the sessions, I will share more experience both from Google perspective and from Indonesia perspective. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, I guess I'll cover a number of things in the conversation. I mean, for me, capitalism is going through one of those intense periods of creative destruction that makes it a very exciting uh, system to live with. Uh, but that means that some industries will be destroyed and some will be created and, and old sources of wealth will disappear and new sources of wealth will reappear. And I think the, the fight around IP is a very key fight in, between industries as to who should get uh, extract the best uh, and most money from the value chain that's being created by modern communications. I think that's something to bear in mind from a free expression point of view from the human rights point of view, as long as if we get access to quality content and access to good quality information, that's what's important. It's not important to us which industries thrive, which live and which die. What matters is what happens to the information and communication environment. So that's the perspective I'll come at it. Copyright, I think, is one of the most breached regulatory systems in the world. Uh, there's a recent study, which I can quote later on, that showed uh, that 98% of BitTorrent users um, are probably violating copyright, and BitTorrent users have been traced to their IP addresses to the US Department of Justice, the regulatory body, the US Homeland Security, the US House of Representatives, the Dutch Bundestag, the European Parliament, the Dutch Parliament, etc. So in other words, the lawmakers and law regulators themselves on an individual basis are violating copyright regularly by using BitTorrent applications to download, to, to, to file share. So it's not you know, teenagers in their bedrooms, this is our lawmakers who are choosing to ignore the very laws around copyright that exist. So when you have systemic law breaking on that scale, you've got a problem with the law. So I think the key issue is how do you, is there a philosophical framework which enables you to come up with a satisfactory solution that can balance the interests of um, copy holders and those who wish to access content. And I think there may be an answer in, some of the, in, in rethinking how we conceptualize freedom of expression at that level. I think the answer won't be found by rigidly enforcing copyright laws, which are already heavily disregarded. I think they are going to require some degree of rethinking and reconceptualization. And personally, I have a question you know, for discussion as to whether principles at this level that they've been drafted, which is really flying at kind of 40 or 50,000 feet in the air really do solve some of the key problems because there's not much here I mean there's pretty much here we can all agree with it 
the issue is not the high-level principle. The, the issue is in the detail about what is a permitted restriction on copyright, what is the permitted access, and principles at this level don't really answer some of those key questions. So there's a whole bunch of issues there that I think I'd want to come back to in the course of the conversation. So um, I work for a company that is less than 10 years old, but in that time has amassed over a billion uh, users, each of which has become a content creator by virtue of their interaction on, on the platform. And I think once you have a disruptive technology um, come, come along and get a following like that, you're, f you're fundamentally changing the ecosystem. So you've now got a billion people who are invested in content creation um, and in innovating with that content, sharing that content, building and using the connections that are possible through that platform um, to, for both freedom of expression but for content creation and content sharing. Um, I think that the industry and um, governments and a lot of stakeholders are still trying to work around, given that rapid change, how do, how do you manage that? What does that actually mean? Um, and I think a really good manifestation of that was, um, well, a really interesting manifestation of that was the SOPA for the debate in the US, where you had um, activation from the internet community, from internet users, suddenly being, suddenly being so invested in their content and the value that they saw in that, that they were engaged in a regulatory debate that previously had seen um, very removed from your everyday person, your everyday internet user. Um, so I really hope we get the opportunity to explore some of those issues um, and to try and understand what it means when you're bringing, you know, a billion plus people into an, an area that had previously been fairly, uh, fairly anodyne and a fairly industry specific con conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, as we know that uh, copyright is the exclusive, exclusive right for the creator to reproduce or to uh, uh, publish. And then uh, the principle, uh, the exclusive right is when someone uh, someone copy another person, another another person works. Then they have to get permission from the other person, the other person, the related person. Uh, that's why uh, we are here. Uh, uh, Creative Commons license, Creative Commons uh, propose the Creative Commons license as an option, another option for the uh, people who want to use content want to uh, make a content from the other person's content with the Creative Commons license so they can easily uh, make uh, creating content, uh, sharing content, and then uh, to access the information as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Andreas, you, you spoke at the beginning about the new definition of creative, um, and yet you think you spend a lot of your time professionally thinking about not only defining that, but also what are the cost imperatives and how can that level of participation uh, be expanded? But what kind of guarantees need to be in place for a new economy? As someone who's studying this so closely, what do you think are the opportunities that can be garnered out of this really painful debate? Uh, thanks. Uh, um, I. Uh, I like stories. So I, those who there were in, in, in the morning uh, in, in session, I already told the story. So I'm 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 just going to tell a story. Uh, and it's sort of a to to to, to answer your question and uh, uh, as an example of of uh, what I'm going to try to say that uh, uh, this uh, new environment provides new opportunities. I have uh, props about my story. Some years ago, I'm an academic, and as an academic, I uh, wrote a book. You know, that's not surprising. Academics write books all the time. We're supposed to, and they don't sell that well, which means that uh, uh, they generally are priced by the uh, publishers uh, out of the reach of, of normal people. Uh, my book is priced at the moment one hundred and nine dollars, uh, seventy nine pounds, or something like that. It's something that most people would not buy, and it's expected. It's it's completely understood that this book is not going to be read by a lot of people because it's 
boring or I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, and and the, the, the whole idea, the whole premise of, of, of this system is predicated on the selling very few books. Uh, so we price them very high. I did not like that. You know, I, I want to be read. I, I became an academic to, to, to have my ideas shared. So um, I did something. I, I, uh, uh, I convinced my publishers to uh, publish the book under a Creative Commons license. Uh, they accepted to my surprise. Uh, I, was, uh, I explained to them, yeah, you know, people are going to be able to take a PDF and copy it and, and share it. And so uh, I travel around uh, everywhere with uh, this uh, prop, uh, which is a, a nice USB key. Uh, and whenever I'm talking to people and uh, the, the topic of my book comes, uh, comes up, I take out the nice Russian doll. There is a nice poetic thing about having a, a book inside a Russian doll. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I give it to them. Uh, they can go and buy it, and it's selling, apparently. Uh, it's still selling, but it's also, I'm trying to share it as, as much as I can. And people are sharing it, and it's in some websites. And if you Google my name, you probably Google, and you'll find the book. So I'm losing money here. But uh, the reason why I wanted to tell this story is that precisely today, I received an email, and, and I've been receiving some of these emails uh, uh, during the last uh, last year, uh, since the book has been published, uh, inviting me to go and speak in a, to, to an event in, in Brussels and, uh, you know, uh, we really liked your book and we read it. Um, they didn't tell me, but I'm guessing that they didn't buy it. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, and, and the idea is this, that the more people are, are sharing the book, and I, I'm, I'm delighted uh, when someone comes and tells me, you know, I read your book, or someone tweeted me recently, oh, uh, I, I read this paragraph from uh, uh, from the book by Andres Guadalmus, and uh, it was completely unexpected. I, I wasn't expecting to read something about uh, Kevin Bacon on the first paragraph that I read. It makes sense if you read the book. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm plugging it, but what I'm trying to say is that it, losing money is, 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 is not important, and this doesn't work for everyone. I'm not trying to advocate that the music industry and the movies industry should try to do this. But it works for me. It, it creates more value to actually have it shared online and that people can Google it and people can download it for free. And maybe some people read it and maybe some people will like it. So Andres, you articulate very well the value of the book to a much broader community. But what does your own personal story tell you about your value? You mm -hmm. started by talking about the value of your book mm -hmm. and you ended by saying, and then I got invited to something. But are you starting to say, or are you describing the beginnings of an alternative economy where the value of your content is, is different and that's more important to you or just as important? Why, you know, I love travel. I love being invited to things uh, and, and uh, have more stamps in my passport than, uh, than is advisable. <laughs> uh, I'm getting jet lagged in interesting places. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But, this is part of, of, of the value that uh, uh, things that I, I, I hold dear, and I will give away my book for free in exchange for those things. Sometimes uh, 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 things of more value that will pay the rent will come up, so uh, a consultancy will appear, uh, an invitation for someone will actually pay me to, to write something, or uh, and all of these things start happening because if I go to places and I talk and I present and I. I uh, it, it, it creates it, it creates value for me and it creates value for I'm hoping for for people who uh, were interested in, in things that I have to say. So yeah, it's it's a new idea. It, it can generate as well money. We need money, uh, but uh, but it's it's, a, it's an alternative. You know? it, 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 that's that's what uh, what I'm saying. I I don't think that everyone is prepared to to share their book for free, uh, but I I highly recommend. I do. The, the concept behind Creative Commons was considered pretty um, impossible when it began. And there was an enormous amount of feedback to the tiny community that began what was thought to be a project that would likely fail. And it's become, and its founders always communicated, that they would create an entirely different system 
the dealing with copyright that would attack the question of what a new digital economy would look like and to try and make information more widely available. How do you see your work going forward given that Andreas agrees with you, there is an alternative way to look at it, but there's a huge challenge out there about what to do with the value of that content. The value of the content of Creative Commons National content? Okay. Basically, uh, um, the Creative Commons have a value like uh, sharing, sharing to empower. Because uh, uh, we believe that any content that we share will make uh, another person uh, have another value from the content and also can uh, help uh, their, their uh, life, economic life or anything. As we know, uh, we have uh, uh, some, some people say that uh, Creative Commons license uh, uh, minimize, minimize, the, minimize the economic benefit. It 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 uh, is not correct because uh, with Creative Commons license, maybe you you don't have you cannot uh, get uh, directly uh, money like uh, like Andreas said that, but uh, when you uh, using license, uh, license Creative Commons license, uh, your works your content will be spread easily, and then people say and people and um, more easy to get your get your content and then uh, your con and then you as a creator of the content will be famous famous and then now nowadays I think uh, famous is tend to uh, monetize money so I think that's uh, that's uh, th th a simple that uh, yes uh, sharing to empower is our value there are you were discussing in your earlier comments that you have this massive number, an unprecedented number of, of creators in the world, and you're essentially the largest aggregator of one of, of, of essentially the largest loose community in the world. How are you seeing the value of that content, and how are you, is Facebook essentially discussing with its users and internally how that value can be protected or grown for the users who are who are basically coming on to, onto Facebook. So I think when we talk about value, there's an, a very quick assumption to think of it in terms of monetization. And I think one of the things about Facebook um, is that yes, that's a piece of it, but that's actually not where the majority of users derive the value from Facebook. So for for most people, it's the ability to communicate with friends and family, the ability to see photos of um, newborns on the other side of the world or um, family vacations. That so I think part of, um, it might be useful for the panel to think about a little more is how, you know, how do you expand um, the definition of value? And be, because you know, there's a lot of debate around uh, content control, but the, the number one um, question that Facebook uses uh, on our site is um, will your service remain free? So people are concerned because they have a lot of value and identity tied up in the platform and that's a free platform uh, and there's, there's a concern that um, there'll be an attempt on our part to, to monetize that or charge a, a, a levy to get into it. And our, our CEO has been very clear that Facebook is free, it will always be free. Um, but I, I just think that we shouldn't immediately, when we talk about mon um, value, assume that we're talking about monetization. Um, within that, I think uh, there are very interesting ways that people are using the platform because what it's, um, what it's giving you is, is this very large audience and not just a passive audience, it's a, it's a collaborative, innovative audience. So you're, you're bringing together a an ecosystem of people who can offer value in different ways. So that can be creative value, um, that can be intellectual capital, that can be, um, you know, taking you know app developers who take the concept, refine it, bring it into into a new content. It, that can be taking uh, an initiative that worked really well in, uh, you know, small town uh, 
Christchurch, <laughs> uh, and then transferring that to, to Indonesia. So you, you're also um, creating value by, by globalizing and internationalizing a lot of um, a lot of intellectual capital that is there. I think we're still working through what that means and how um, people, you know, whether the how they derive and how they define that value is still an evolution. Um, but I think that's part of the reason that it's useful to talk about these concepts. And as you know, as has been pointed out by other panelists, it's, it's a baseline. It's a forty thousand foot. But at least we're starting to to broaden out and not just um, to, to try and catch the conversation up to where the disruptive technologies have taken us. Um, there's a relatively new discussion going on around the personal data movement and how that might be defined. Is this something that people are bringing to Facebook and how is that conversation evolving? Sure, and, and could you be more specific? Um, there's, there's actually a community that started in Silicon Valley that has been thinking through frameworks for the beginning point and the end point of, of personal data. So perhaps not just what you share, but your digital footprint. And um, when we talk about semantic data and the usage of, uh, of different kinds of um, platforms and devices, that there's an enormous amount of data that's inside that, that's been gathered by those who are best at doing it. Um, and there's a question mark uh, in this rapidly evolving, evolving environment about how that can be harnessed or what might happen to it um, given that it has an unknown value to an individual at this point, um, but it's of increasing value, which isn't often quantified by many companies around the world. Sure. So I think the way that we think about it in terms of the service that we provide is to structure that service around um, three commitments which is to, uh, to our users, which are transparency, accountability, and control. So we want to ensure that what our platform is doing, we're transparent about it. Um, and we're still innovating the ways that we do that, but we'll communicate through blogs, we'll communicate um, through media, we'll communicate through a lot of different avenues um, because our product is it's an iterative platform. It's not static. And Facebook today is not Facebook of 2007, and I think that's for the better of everyone. I think in terms of accountability, we have to recognize, and I hope, I, I think there's a growing recognition amongst um, companies globally that they have to be accountable to their users, and they have to have they have to maintain that relationship of trust, uh, and that's only going to exist where where there is accountability. Where, and and there have been times where we've innovated products and then put our hand up and said, Look, "Sorry, move too fast. Got your feedback. We're changing it." So I think that that's a piece of accountability. And then the third is control, and I think that's really important. It's that when you're using technology, that you feel you have the ability to control the content that you share. And we have, again, um, innovated on that. So you know, the product, Facebook, uh, you know, a few years ago, had fairly blunt tools in terms of who you could share with, how you could control that information. And now we've got to a place where every piece of content that you share on that platform, you, you select the audience. You, ha you exercise control over who that is shared with, and, and you decide um, the extent to which that's going to be shared. Thank you. Andrew, are there going to be winners and losers with this much disruption? Um, <clears throat> there certainly will, but I, and, and I think we need to figure out who are the people we want to win, who do we need to win. And I think, for me, there is a real issue about how content is created and paid for. So I, I take Sarah's point. I mean, I can blog and tweet and create content. I can't create Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is a fantastic series, one of the best things I've seen on television. Shakespearean in scope. But for me to consume Breaking Bad, there had to be a very substantial investment in the set, in the directors, in the writer, in the actors. And these people have to get paid. You know, someone has to get paid. So. The fact that the internet allows all of us to be creative content does not mean we're all going to be suddenly making Breaking Bad for nothing and giving it away. So you do need an economic model to be working here that incentivizes really creative content. Now, uh, creative content can come in a number of ways. Shakespeare had no protection from copyright law. Copyright law came in with Queen Anne in 1713. Shakespeare therefore made no money from his plays other than being the part owner of a theatre. That was his business model. So he made money from the audience coming in through the door. 
and he borrowed copy, you know, he borrowed his plots from just about every other source. He was a hopeless plagiarizer. It had been done on 18 copyright regulations if he was writing now because nothing he wrote was original. But he had a business model that was sustainable that enabled the creation of that kind of content in that particular environment. So we've got to think about this quite carefully because we do need to find a business model that's appropriate for the digital age. And I think rigidly enforcing a law that's being systemically broken by lawmakers is clearly not it. But it is equally has to be something that recognizes there's a need to generate serious professional content and for people to be willing to pay and able to pay for that content, either directly or through a taxation on the platform companies who are making vast amounts of money by exchanging content or whatever. And just a correction, I mean, Facebook actually isn't free. I mean, in the internet, if, it's, if you're using it free, you are the product. I mean, my data is being sold or I'm being marketed stuff. That's how Facebook makes its money. It's not a, it's not a kind of philanthropic enterprise. It's a business. It just has a different business model to Fox, which has a different business model. So I think we need to look at balancing how we incentivize really creative free expression and at the same time protect uh, the rights of, of people to access content as openly as possible. And there are, I think, current regulations are far too restrictive. I mean, the academic world, which is predominantly publicly funded, finds most of its output shielded behind paywalls or hopelessly expensive academic books published by specialist publishers. And I see that as a kind of theft from the public commons. My taxes are going into paying academics like Andreas, and his books are then far too expensive for me or anyone else to buy. That's, that should change. That's just ridiculous. That, that's not a viable, that's not a public interest or a viable business model. So I think, you know, it's a complicated argument. I mean, and I think we have to recognize creators have interests that we should respect. Distributors have interests that we should respect. And we all have rights of access to content that should be respected. I think we have to rebalance the current regime. That's a complex issue. There are going to be fights over it and winners and losers. But within all that, we have to recognize that there is a genuine crisis around the creation of and sustaining of quality content. If you look at what's happening to the media in most of the developed world where there's a, where there's a good internet, you know, quality is declining because people won't pay for content. So, but, you know, there's a, there's a genuine problem. Let's be honest. And they say, there is that problem, and I'm sure we're all in this room breaking copyright at some point or another in our lives. So if we're talking about one of the oldest laws around content in the world, so it's an 18th century uh, legal construct, if we're looking to today and we're imagining or, or, or supposing that this is the most disruptive time yet for such a law, what would be examples of how we could more carefully think about how we might address that challenge? We're very good at articulating the problems um, and we've become increasingly aware of what many of those are. But on the other hand, there's been a real struggle to find the solutions to those in a way that addresses not only the, the changing market, um, but what it means for, for individuals everywhere. Yeah, well, if, let's look at examples where it has been successfully balanced, antiviral drugs which the pharmaceutical industry tried to insist was sold at high cost throughout the world. And there was a big battle with the Ind Indians and South Africans about producing generic antiretrovirals anti at a much cheaper price. And eventually the ph big pharma came around to that and accepted there'd be a high price in the developed world, but it would be a cheaper price in less developed markets. So they, were, they allowed heavy, heavy discounting or reproduction, you know, local licensed production at much lower cost. You're going to have to look at things like that where you, you recognize that in developing markets, people are not going to be able to afford the content. If they can't afford it, they'll take it, unless you adjust your pricing mechanism to a point when it becomes affordable for an average citizen of Indonesia to buy Breaking Bad, you know, which at a Western price would not be affordable. So I think there needs to be less of a, it, it, there's going to be a spectrum, I think, of policy globally. And I think rather than try and fight a global battle by the content providers, which I think they'll lose in the, in the current Sopa Pippa showed you that they'll lose the big legislative battles if they try and fight them, act to show that they'll lose it because of popular opposition. They need, the content providers need to moderate their view. And then the, some of the platform companies need to think, if people are using our platforms to share and exchange this content, should we make a contribution to funding people who provide content? You know, should we be offering if there's a, you know, if someone publishes an interesting article and there are hundreds of thousands of hits, 
should we be providing through some minimal taxation on our own profit a bit of income to that person who produced that content? Is there a business model there we could look at? We need to be, I think, a bit more imaginative than we've been now and recognize that there's going to be some quite profound changes produced by this technology. David, there was um, a mention earlier about uh, the critical value of high quality content that the studies now show and the absorption now shows that even with a massive proliferation of informal video and things that are made anecdotally easily at home by groups and communities, by crowds, that there's still an enormous appetite for really high quality product which takes time and real resources to build. So there is a defensive argument that's been described by private industry that specializes in this and there's a long history of how they've succeeded. Where's it going? Where is it going to end up when you move further into this debate but also beyond it in terms of where you think content creation is going to go? Content creation, or are you looking more at content distribution? Or are you looking at the uh, split between professional content and more user generated type of content? I'm not exactly sure what aspect of the question you're asking me to answer. In the first instance, it's actually about the creation of content. So Breaking Bad, not necessarily for 20th Century not Fox, but, um, uh, but there, I'm sure there are many others. To, but I mean, literally 20th Century Fox was involved in some of the biggest filmmaking in the world and some of the biggest blockbusters. Glee, Modern Family. Glee, Modern Family. <laughs> Let's give him a plug. Um, so, uh, so we know that this is valuable. Um, but we also know that there's an enormous challenge. There's a huge amount of private uh, piracy around this. And we know that in a place like Indonesia, I can probably buy Glee much more cheaply at a set of traffic lights than I could if I was to go downtown New York or okay. to download it. I think, as I said at the outset, we have two overarching goals as content creators. Number one is to create the compelling content that people want to consume. And number two, to distribute that content as broadly as we can across as many platforms as we can. We don't produce content as commercial producers of content to keep it from, from, the public, from public consumption. It is about consuming content that people are willing to pay for and people want to therefore consume. So we will continue to do that. We will do it in a way that adapts with technology and I think that we've been very good at adapting uh, to technology. I'll just give you a few examples. First of all, when the DVD first came out and people started, DVD came out, so did uh, more mobile devices. We originally started to provide a digital copy with DVD once we realized that people weren't just sitting at home and watching a DVD but wanted to have it on their iPad, etc. So we gave them an additional option to watch it at home and to watch it when, uh, to be able to download that to their iPad and watch it on the go. As, devi as uh, consumers moved more online, we, we all licensed our content to iTunes. People talk about the technology industry as driving innovation, but we've actually licensed our content that actually makes those services relevant to the user. So it's a symbiotic relationship between us as the content producer that licenses the content to the more innovative platforms. And in iTunes, it allowed for format shifting, basically. When you've, purchased the, when you've licensed the content, you can watch it across different devices. And now we've moved to yet another model, which is called Ultraviolet. I don't know if you all are aware of it, but it's a, it's a cloud-based service whereby if you license particular content from an online, or from a, by a DVD, or you license it from an online distributor, there is a key up, um, held up in the cloud. I'm not a technologist, so I might not use all the right terms, but we have a technologist from our industry in the room. Braxton, correct me if I don't say this properly. But there's a key that will indicate that you have purchased access to that content. Six family members can access that content across 12 devices. So we as an industry have had to keep up with the changing lifestyles that our consumers are living. And we have adapted our business models to do that. So I think continued adaptation of our business models is key. But I'd like to come back to the point that Andrew said, because I think it's part of it, where Andrew has said when there's systemic um, disregard for a law, you have to reassess that law. Well, I think if you look back at history, at least in my country, there has been different ways that we've handled some of these systemic disregards, disregarding of law. First, when you think of drinking and driving. In the United States, 
there was very widespread drinking and driving in the 60s, 70s, etc. Government realized that that was a huge health issue, huge problem from a societal perspective. And therefore, they changed the law to made it, make it illegal, but they also engaged in a huge educational campaign to inform people of the dangers um, and the economic and the health risks that that uh, went along with drinking and driving. Same with seatbelts. They first passed laws that said you must wear seatbelts. Widely ignored. But yet again, governments decided we've got to change this behavior because it's something that society should not incur. And they, huge educational campaign to do it. And now, I think almost everybody, at least in the United States and Europe, the first thing you do when you get in a car is you, you put on a seatbelt. So it's not just about ignoring what is important for whether it is safety, culture, society, it's trying to define what's important and then defining a legal framework that protects those things that are important to society. And I would argue that culture is incredibly important to society. We promote culture by producing content. We promote making sure that people are, are informed by the news that we produce, by the content that we produce. Ensuring an informed society is important to the overall uh, country's overarching goal. So I think we need to define what's important and protect what is important and develop legal frameworks and cooperative arrangements to promote those things that are important to society. So you're comparing a legal framework for uh, privately produced content at scale with some of the largest behavior change campaigns in the world that were government funded. Are you also saying that it's, it behooves and is incumbent upon every government to do a better new job at helping to protect your industries with new laws? Because when we reflect upon the, the drink and drive uh, campaigns and when we look at the issue of seatbelts, in both cases, um, the, the greatest successes of both of those campaigns have been based on punitive measures related to the law. One of the reasons why uh, in the United States there's a greater number of uh, of, uh, of car deaths, of, of drink driving deaths, is because there's a higher tolerance in different state laws around what is what is legal with, with alcohol consumption and driving. So that we've seen that punitive measure work in other places. Um, and we know that these behaviour change campaigns have been very elaborate, they continue to be studied, and the behavioural economics of those uh, have, have been rolled out over the course of decades. So. What does this really mean if we're talking about creating new legal frameworks? I don't think we... Perhaps there are some areas where we need new legal frameworks, but I think we need to promote behavioral change, and that can largely be done through education. I think we need to ensure that there is a res that, that responsibility is assumed by all actors across the value chain so that they take their respective roles to promote not just the safety of their users, but also the, the creation of a legitimate marketplace online. Um, so a few examples. Um, if you, uh, l l let me talk about things that don't require legislative change right now. First of all, I think there, the research indicates that many users don't know the difference between a legitimate and an illegitimate website. So we need to actually take specific measures to prevent illegitimate websites from looking legitimate. What, is, what, what are some of those measures that can be taken? Number one, you need to stop advertising, advertisements be appearing on those sites, and in particular, from legitimate brands. There is research, well, 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 I'll get to that research in a minute. The second thing you need to do is stop legitimate payment processors from, accept, from facilitating financial transactions. If I can pay for uh, content on a site with my MasterCard, as an end user, I, don't, I would assume that that's a legitimate website, right? And I think that there are, so, so those are some things that can be done and are actually being done cooperatively across the industry sectors. We have self-regulatory regime being developed with the advertising industry and with the payment processors. I also think that there is responsibility for the internet access providers, and I think that there is a broad framework in place in Europe where we can obtain injunctions um, against the intermediaries if there are no fault injunctions, um, whereby they block access to sites, the, the offshore sites 
that are providing uh, infringing content to subscribers in their country. This has actually been a very cooperative arrangement with the ISPs in the UK and across Europe. It's a no-fault process, as I said, so we, we're not arguing that the intermediaries are liable, but since they're best placed to stop the infringement, we get an injunction, and they have worked with us. They don't oppose the injunctions, and they've actually blocked access to these sites, and there hasn't been any problem, but what we have seen is traffic to those sites has dropped significantly, I think, by some, by some measures, over, well over 80%. Um, so I think that there are things that we can do together to legitimize the marketplace. When we talk to a lot of our distributors, online distributors, and we ask them what barriers they're confronting, one of the, one of the first things they say is piracy. How can I compete against a website that is actually not paying licensing fees? When I'm paying licensing fees, to content producers. I, I, I can't do that. I can't compete with that. So even the online, innovative online platforms identify piracy as a big problem. And so we need to work together to educate users about the difference between legitimate and illegitimate, the value of copyright. People often, when they're, I, I'm going on and on, tell me to stop whenever, but people think about, when people think about film studios, they often think about the stars and the wealthy stars. But you know behind, ev behind those stars, is a carpenter that has built the set. There is the sound guy who is, you know, making sure that the sound is right. The hairdressers. There are a whole host of people whose livings are based on, um, on the production uh, of our movies, and it's copyright that allows us to be able to pay those people to do their to do their jobs and to to earn a fair wage. So, uh, YouTube gets requests every day from organizations like David. Uh, to be involved in takedowns uh, to ensure that copyright is observed. And yet Google prides itself on being one of the largest, most innovative spaces for the communication of all kinds of content. And there's a vigorous debate about whether this is moving into the new economy and it needs to be disrupted and some of this is okay, um, and, that, and whether and how to protect some of the more traditional producers who are looking for new ways to protect that content. Thank you. That's, that would always be a very interesting debate. Um, at Google, we have the Google Content ID. Right now, I think 21st Century Fox is also uh, part of the uh, license holders that, that you know, basically uploaded their images um, and the data banks to, um, to be part of the Google Content ID. It's not perfect, which is why it's not perfect. Um, right now, I think we have like some 15 million images and adding more. Um, which is basically also coming from those license holders as well as the user-generated content. Um, it's not perfect. That's why we have the other mechanism. We have the flagging system, etc., and the takedown system, and it's been working very well with the music industry and the film industry to um, help them protect their copyright. Uh, but what I would like to also highlight here is not just that aspect, but also the aspect that you were mentioning in your previous question, which is the user-generated content. The platform like YouTube has enabled content creators that otherwise would not have had the opportunity because they don't have the skill or they don't have the capital that the people at Breaking Bad um, was able to have. They don't have the skill set they don't have the uh, access to or the connections that people in making Glee has. Um, I'm taking, um, I like stories as well. So um, I'll, I'll be taking some stories, for example, uh, from Indonesia. Um, there are a numbers of Indonesia content creators, but they're doing it in a very, uh, but, but they're doing it because they, they like it. Uh, it's free is give the opportunity for people to just try and fail. And I think it's really, it's a really good attitude. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get recognized if it has to go through all the distribution channel or the traditional distribution channel that exists. Uh, for example, uh, in, on the YouTube channel, which is, you know, you can create it very easily. It's free. You can upload, you know, whatever you want as long as, um, you know, you're not, basically um, uh, taking over the copyrights that others have. 
Um, there's a Saturday Night with Miko, which is basically is a stand-up comedy uh, and series of sketches of comedy, which no TV station would pick it up. But the audience love it. And because the audience pick it up and love it, then the mainstream media start taking a look at it. These are also content creators that, you know, that needs to be paid attention. And especially in this, uh, in this era in which it's very democratizing, uh, it's, and it's, you know, it provides a lot of equality to others as well. Because, and then another thing is, uh, and this is also happening in Facebook, a lot of people that use Facebook are actually use Facebook for um, online shopping or online shop. Now it's sort of like they still use Facebook, but they put what they sell on YouTube. And this actually gives the small and medium enterprises a possibility to do apps for their own without having to go to advertising agency, without having to make their own advertisement which would cost enormously and probably would bankrupt them. Um, another example is some small handicraft uh, furniture uh, shop and maker in Jogjakarta uh, whose export is now going global. Um, they put, they have a website, they put it on, you know, Google Maps as well as they have a, uh, they show their products on YouTube. Um, and then uh, people then can start, um, you know, they can start uh, ordering. But this also opened another set of questions and another set of challenge. And online payment, for example, all in the numbers of countries, they, the, the, the regulatory system and the regulatory framework is actually not ready to cope and to, uh, to accept and to adapt the, this new business model. And I think that's uh, some of the challenges that we still need to work together. Looking at IGEM, um, I'm remembering another uh, small and medium enterprises that actually focusing on um, preservation of batik, another Indonesian heritage, by putting it on online. If it wasn't because of the digital age, it wouldn't be put online. And so you would only see the type of batik that you see. The flexible regime, based on the, some work that's been done by the Creative Commons, allow some modification and some expansion of the traditional motives while still preserving the heritage itself. So these are, these are the new phenomena that we need to take into place. And I think there's a huge room that needs to be, that needs to be, um, that needs to be taken uh, by either the industry, um, the user, the consumer, to continue educate the user for us in terms of cons consumer protection, as well as to inform the regulators of the changes. Because by the end of the day, it's very difficult for this new growth to continue growing if the regulator is so way behind. And in many developing countries, this is what happens. And the first thing that any regulators or anybody, it's, it's very much human nature, when you don't know things, you stay away from it. And if you are a regulator and you don't know, you're not comfortable, you do not want to be blamed, then you ban things. But the moment you start banning things, you stop progress. So finding the balance of continue cultivating progress, at the same time continue protecting the copyright, is a delicate you know, balance that still needs to be worked out, especially in a developing country. Sarah, are, are we missing anything when we're talking about and thinking about rewarding creators? Uh, you described some of the trends earlier on that you're seeing that were unexpected in the way that so much of this technological change and the value of it is unexpected. What's coming down the line? What are you seeing that's the newest of this and where is it going to progress? Is there anything to say about where it might head? Sure. I mean, it's, it's always speculative and particularly when you're in um, an area like this that just evolves at such a fast rate. I think um, the points that Andrew was making before about uh, the need for the system to sort of e evolve, um, I think we're going to see that a lot more because you're having, um, I think you're having a whole range of people accessing um, a, a, an audience they never did, an audience they didn't have, and part of the um, 
part of the challenge, I think, is working through um, how you reward that. And I, I don't think we're there. I don't think um, there, there are a couple of interesting things. But one of the questions, one of the real problems is, is access. You've still got a very divided internet. So we're talking about a technology which isn't available um, you know, to around 5 billion people who don't have the sort of access. So um, I think that's going to be a significant change. You're going to see a lot more people having access to the internet in the next five to ten years. And once, um, once you've got a truly global internet, uh, that's going to present a whole lot of, of challenges as well. Um, and that's going to further sort of democratize these issues of access and markets because you've got a very um, Western, I think, dominated initially technology. I think, and I think Andrew's point about um, winners, and losers, uh, winners and losers will emerge, but I think it's really hard to pick. You, you wouldn't, a lot of the startups that people rely on now, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, people thought of that as, spec you know, 120 characters, how is that going to be a business model? How are people going to make money about that? How is that going to revolutionize media? And yet it has. Um, so I certainly don't feel expert enough to sort of look into the crystal ball and, and tell you, you know, buy Twitter stock. Um, but I, I think part of it is being, being open-minded and having, um, I mean, two trends. One is the shift to mobile and making sure that people are um, conscious of that and that conscious of that our connection is not, not a, a desktop technology anymore. Um, and then the, sh the shift away from um, an internet of two billion people to hopefully an, an internet that incorporates everyone. Aju, what, what does Creative Commons in Indonesia have to teach the rest of the world as one of the countries where you're seeing huge changes to, conce uh, to content consumption and sharing uh, as, as people more rapidly get online? Basically, uh, uh, we are trying to introduce that the common slice of Indonesia by uh, introduce copyright system because, as we know, uh, copyright is very is a complicated issue in Indonesia. They don't uh, most of people don't understand about what copyright is, what what is uh, prohibited, and what is uh, permission permitted. So we starting with the uh, uh, giving uh, knowledge about uh, copyright and then after that and we introduce the Creative Commons license. Uh, when we, uh, before we introduce Creative Commons license, yeah, they they always uh, they they create they create something but they don't they don't care and don't and understand uh, this is it is prohibited or not to take uh, someone someone works. But when they know about that Commons license, they are more aware about the content, the content uh, who has a license, that the Commons license or not, and they also uh, know about the extension and limitation in the creative, uh, in the copyright. So uh, they uh, uh, they have another option to use uh, the content for uh, uh, to creating con content and to access all the information. We have a little bit of time for questions and, and comments from from all of you. So, um, who are our first takers? Tiska, Doviana. Um, my question is for Facebook, um, because we've been uh, discussing about this in Jakarta previously, and um, the our minister said. Uh, it's really difficult to tax the big players that in Indonesia. Therefore, uh, the Indonesian content are pretty um, content producer was kind of shallow in quality because uh, even though there's a lot of people are actually creating content, it couldn't scale because they don't have the capital to actually move move it forward. The first thing that came to the minister's mind is actually taxing, but how? Because it was hosted somewhere else, not in Indonesia, and it has, it has different regulations. Uh, however, uh, she's open to any suggestions on how the big players could actually benefit 
in Indonesia and one of the one of the participants was actually saying that other things that the big players uh, being consumed in Indonesia that is actually more important is they have data and in order to make decisions for decisions maker they usually need data the one that they don't have because the big players do uh, they have it there so in, they have to ask like what uh, uh, the, 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 the data and I just thought to myself uh, because Facebook is actually using the data for something else um, is it possible if the taxation is about data that we tax you with data for Indonesia as a country So that, that's an issue that's playing out in Indonesia but also globally. Um, I know one of the suggestions that, that the Indonesian government is considering is around um, having data localized within Indonesia um, and precisely for the economic reasons that you stipulated. I think um, there are a number of, of challenges for that. Firstly, um, companies like uh, Facebook, Google, others don't segment data on a on a national basis. So we don't have a data center um, for Swedish citizens. We don't have a data center for UK citizens. The the data is, is intermingled and not um, based on national jurisdiction. Um, so in looking at passing uh, legislation like that creates a real challenge because the technology is not yet there to a way that we could say, okay, here's our Indonesian data center for all Indonesians and, and the data will all reside in this territory. You're also um, potentially, instead of uh, enabling uh, an sort of an innovative uh, culture, it's going to end up in a situation where that, that creates a lot of cost and so because you've got a different technical structure in specific jurisdictions, you won't, you simply won't roll out some of the best products that you have, or you're going to have to pass on costs in other ways. So, in many, the potential there is also, I know the the instinct and the intent is to try and enable um, and 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 get more money into this. But potentially, you risk adding costs to users. Um, so, I, I think, um, I think. It's an area where the models are going to continue to evolve, and but we've got to make sure that they do it in a way that are that is cognizant of the technical challenges. Um, I might ask uh, Shinto to also respond as, as uh, a lead for for, uh, uh, for policy with Google. Um, I think that's a very interesting question uh, and statement, uh, something that we have been discussing with the government as well. The way we should look at it is actually looking at it, you know, uh, end to end. Uh, what does the Indonesian government want? My understanding is that from the many conversations I had with the Indonesian government is that first of all they want the data localization is because um, a number of reasons, consumer protection uh, one, uh, is one of the reasons. Um, but we need to look at it in terms of tax, in terms of uh, tax taxation. Is taxing the data is actually much more beneficial for Indonesia? Or actually, the government should create a regulatory framework that would be so robust and so um, uh, innovative and, and uh, uh, in in helping Indonesia content creator because we have a lot of Indonesia content creators. What happened is, if you want them to and you know like a, a growing e-commerce business as well, Indonesian government always said that we do not want to be only market we want to be a player in order for Indonesia to be a player Indonesia needs to continue uh, working um, towards incentive of having more local content creator which is um, I, I'm not sure about Facebook but Google is doing it Microsoft is doing it um, some other technology companies are also doing it on the ground um, helping Indonesian app developer, for example, to get on Google Play. Right now, they can get on Google Play, but when it comes to paid apps, they can't because central banks does not allow it. So who's 
with the moment you can actually download the Google Apps, the paid Google Apps from Google Play, that means Indonesia local crea local content creator can get money and Indonesian government could get tax out of it. So which one do we want? And that is and that is a source of um, revenue that because it's you know human capacity, it would never it would it's not like coal which would be you know depleted at some point. We got numbers of SMEs. Uh, some of the examples that that uh, that I used that was able to grow global, but then when they want to ship their stuff, then unable to do so because of the logistical problem. They're also whereas if they can send their stuff, it's CAT for Indonesian government. Uh, so there are a numbers of issues that need to be looked at really strategically and carefully in order for Indonesian government and the whole ecosystem to be able to benefit the best from the digital age. Andre, at the risk of extending a conversation that includes the word taxation in it, a quarter to four in the afternoon, um, are there new, are there new uh, uh, possibilities and trends in this area for tackling these problems? Yes, uh, I was actually going to turn the table and uh, maybe why does the Indonesian government want to tax or what does it want to tax in this area? I, I'm, I'm really curious because uh, I, I hear the, the T word and, and uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's the Ministry for Creative Industry, and uh, the Ministry would like the creative people content, and not only the business, because I'm from in, in Indonesian language Wikipedia, Wikipedia, and that's not business, and uh, a lot of things. Uh, the Ministry thinks it needs infrastructure to actually help the content creators to scale. Right now, the, even the good one couldn't scale, couldn't move on. Like he said, there's a Google Play, there's a Google this and a Google that. It's still using a Google Streamline. So what about our own? Uh, agreed that if uh, we are taking the approach of China, it means that we shut down everything in order to have it all localized. We don't want that. Because even in Facebook where people selling, uh, not selling, people have profiles, people are selling stuff, so it becomes economically beneficial too. But in the same time, uh, the the ministry thinks it should have a capital and although not entirely agree that it should be the form of tax because the minute that it comes to the taxation department it won't go out <laughs> so um, she was thinking like what other things that can be done that we should do it and uh, since we are being um, how do you call it we are being put as a consumers only. We want to you know, switch it. So I think it's it's a really cool way to think. And even though I'm from the anarchy side, uh, I believe that she has a point. <laughs> Do you have any more questions or comments, Paolo Landeri from Wipo? Thank you very much for very uh, thoughtful uh, comments as I, I've heard and uh, you, you really touch upon many different issues and I would like to, to stress one, one remark, one comment and two small questions. The remark is that although it's nothing new and uh, I know it was the, an underlining principle that was cross-cutting all the intervention, was never openly mentioned that there is a difference between uh, illegal and free. I mean, free uh, not, does not equal uh, illegal. In fact, free is compatible with business models, uh, with legal business models, while uh, illegal is not compatible with business. And we can see a clear trend towards this kind of uh, legal offer that in developed markets are growing. The media industry is growing in terms of numbers. Okay, you cannot, uh, sorry. Uh, it's growing in terms of numbers. So that's. Uh, one point. Uh, uh, in terms of question, I, I very much uh, uh, agree with the fact that we need to find a balanced solution to keep uh, uh, rewarding and uh, creativity. The, the, 
professional creativity. My question is, how do you find, how do you reach this balanced solution that will keep uh, rewarding economically those professional creators? Do you leave it to the industry's battle? Do you leave it to technology de technological development? To new uh, social networks uh, development? Is that the solution, or do we need uh, a little bit of intervention from public power? That's an open question. I'm not assuming the answer. And on a second question, let me play what I see partially, partially a missing element in the panel, which are the, the first chain, uh, you know, the first ring of the chain, the creators, the authors. I know uh, we have the creators, the authors, authors. We have the industry, but you know very well, David, that not all, you don't have always the same interest. And I wouldn't put uh, the hairdresser, with all due respect, Addresser at the same level of a uh, film uh, creator, uh, film director, or uh, creators in the music industry. They, are, they, they play a different role and they possibly deserve a different treatment. That was the original objective of copyright. We are missing, I believe, a little, at least the mention of those people that uh, they, some beliefs are essential to start kickstart the creation process. So nowadays we are facing a situation where the numbers of the media industry is growing. At the same time, if you look at the royalties collected by collecting societies, authors collecting societies, the weight of the digital revenues does not reach 5%. So if you compare those analysis, those numbers, is pretty striking. Do you see this as a problem? Do you see something that um, creates uh, a general problem to be solved, or it will be just uh, uh, passed through new ways, new channels through which those creators will receive uh, the economic remuneration they need to make a living? So as we, as we talk about the democratization of the ability to create and share content, the, the truth is that the economics of scale get nowhere near the traditional privately created content that has a higher value and has a traditional sale value. Is that, is that what you're saying? My question is... If I'm not mistaken, I, I think, Paulo, you're talking about how do you ensure that the creator of, who might be the creator is not the producer of the, the professional content, how does how the creator, how do we ensure sufficient remuneration as we move from the more traditional business models to online? Yes, if you want, I mean, clear categories, we have industries, professional producers, but on the side and within the industry, you have professional creators. And if you look to the revenue stream and how the industry works, they do not have always the same interest. Several times, they have conflicting industry, uh, interest, and uh, we, we need to somehow highlight those differences and how you, you, you defend uh, an economic viability of uh, their activity. Andrew, as, as you, um, as, in your work with global partners, talk to people around the world about how to think about legal and policy frameworks to address issues like this. Um, what, what kind of advice can be given or how can those creators and others prepare for what's happening? I mean, I think there's not going to be a simple answer because the type of creator, if you protect the creator, and that, that's very important to me, the important person here is the creator, not the industry. Sometimes the creator needs the industry, but actually the online world can sometimes mean the creator can bypass the industry. So there's a group in the UK called London Grammar, very, a trio, very simple instruments. They've been producing music online and putting it out on YouTube and their own channel for about nine months free. They've been building up a following, doing some live concerts, they then issued an album, and it went to number two in the chart. They made a lot of money, even though a lot of the record, a lot of the songs on the album have actually been available online for some time. It's a very interesting example of how the internet can be used to market and create an audience awareness. Uh, now, you can't do that for Breaking Bad. You know what I mean? Breaking Bad is a serious, major investment in, in production. So that, those, those things aren't comparable, and I know... I think music is in a place probably where film is not yet. I mean, maybe film will one day mutate there, 
but I doubt it. So the way I think of it is not a property right versus free expression, which is the classic legal framework, but as two forms of free expression, incentivizing the free expression of the creator versus protecting the public interest and the right to access to information and free expression of the user. And that would require, rather than, if you have a property right versus, I mean, getting into more legal language, you have a property right versus free expression, then you apply a set and certain standard. The restrictions on content being available have to be necessary in democratic society, proportionate, governed by law, and so on. There's a formula. If you see it as two competing free expression rights, then essentially you have a spectrum here where in different environments, the spectrum will in some areas move much more towards the protection of the creator and in other areas will move much more towards the protection of the user and the person providing the access. And that will depend very much on the practical realities of the industry or of the distribution mechanism, the content themselves. So it's, it's a messier thing. Not, uh, it's, a, it's a new approach being looked at by an Argentinian um, law a faculty at Palermo University and a Canadian organization, Center of Law and Democracy. They're exploring this now, and I think they're coming up with what I would see to be a very interesting and innovative approach to rethinking this kind of balance on copyright. So I, I think there's, there's not a simple answer to your question, because I think the world is moving in a very complex manner, and the disruption of the Internet is impacting very differently on different kinds of creative industries. So I'm going to bridge the two questions in, into a, a single answer. As Sarah mentioned, if there's a cost imposed on Facebook, they're going to either have to figure out a way to monetize it so that they can, um, they can recoup that cost through some sort of payment, or they're going to have to pass it on some way to, to another party. Well, when we produce a show like Glee or Modern Family, not Breaking Bad, but Glee or Modern Family, you know, it costs us millions and millions of dollars. And if you look at some of these new and innovative uh, remuneration regimes, it's very unlikely that we would be able to continue to produce that compelling content. And I think Andrew recognized that, that shows like Breaking Bad are going to be different than some of the uh, newer forms of content that are being produced online. So now how do we go about ensuring that, that, that the creator, perhaps, is, is remunerated? Well, I think you have to look at different content sectors differently, obviously. And Paula, you're going to know this better than me, but for example, in the film industry, the, the rights are actually concentrated in the producer. So we basically have to engage in a contractual negotiation with the performers, with the creators, et cetera, and make sure that they're getting what they perceive is a fair share of the pie. And I don't know if you do remember this, but a few years back, the studios were engaged in very difficult negotiations with the Screen Actors Guild in the United States where they basically were going to go on strike because they didn't fa feel that they were getting a fair share of the digital revenues. Well, we went to the negotiating table and we came up with a commercial agreement between us and the Screen Actors Guild. So from the film industry, unlike the music industry where, where the rights aren't concentrated in the label, for example, um, a lot of this is handled through commercial negotiation between the producers of the content and then you know, the creators and the screen actors, etc. So you have to look at different content sectors differently, and I truly believe, like Andrew, that you have to look, you have to differentiate between, I hate to say non-professional content, but, but user-generated user content and, and very expensive professional content where we actually need to develop a business model that allows us to recoup the, the, the money from what... Uh, is, are very risky investments. As I said, seven out of 10 films don't make money. An advertising-based business model is just not gonna work for us when we are spending so much money on producing content. And I think if you, if you wanna look at one industry that has been impacted by attempting to engage in, a, in an ad-based business model only, all you have to do is look at the newspaper industry in the developed world, where if you look at Le Mans today, it went from being about 50 pages to about being you know, sometimes 20 pages. Um, and a lot of that has to do with their initial attempts of trying, as they went from the more traditional distribution of paper, newspapers from physical world to digital, they attempted to move only to an advertising business model, and it just didn't work. It's expensive to produce news. You have, new, you have journalists, you have uh, editors, you have you know, the whole value chain in the production of a newspaper. And ad business models just do not reward the entire creative value chain sufficiently for, for professional content. 
you have another question or comment? Thanks. I want to leave my notes. I'm Jeremy Blackman from Australia, the Alana and Madeline Foundation. We actually do a lot of, I wanted to come back to, I think, a point that you made earlier, one of the panelists, about behaviour change programs. Um, referring it back to um, road safety, wearing of seatbelts, and um, the kind of regulations that um, support, or well, the laws that support that and encourage people to follow follow that, and kind of relating it back to copyright in the same way. Um, I think the the work that we've, we've done with behaviour change in terms of online safety and also um, kind of being responsible with online ethics, and including copyright, is what we've learned is that, um, and actually one of our programs, this one, is based on um, road safety programs in Australia, including Sun Smart and the Quit Smoking campaign, is that the change in behaviours has to stem from um, from an actual fundamental attitude, attitudinal change, so that the the actual user or the um, consumer of content has to be, feel like they're making that choice based on their own attitudes. So, okay, for those of you who seen the movie Inception, it's that similar idea. <laughs> um, it, ca it can't be a top-down. So, so if we relate it back to seatbelts, um, they're, they're making a conscious choice to wear seatbelts to, because they believe that without wearing them, it, it endangers their life, or, um, or, or, or the guilt, the guilt trip of um, kind of impinging on their family or putting their family out as well. Um, so, um, and we do a lot of work with kids actually and their attitudes towards uh, content and copyright and, and kind of. Um, I can broadly say that a lot of the kids we've had on, on panels and workshops um, really do openly confess to an entitlement mentality of downloading content, and even though they're not uh, kind of money earners in the same way that adults are, um, that um, they they do see themselves moving into adulthood, um, not really respecting um, the the kind of the, the resources that have gone into making this professional content, um, even though they are of course themselves um, content creators. Uh, yeah, uh, I completely agree, and uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm just using my own stories today, and it's the, the only way of keeping me uh, keeping myself awake. Uh, um, I pirated, I can I can say, or I downloaded uh, illegally uh, the uh, first uh, two. Uh, yeah, I'm saying uh, the first. Uh, two seasons of uh, Breaking Bad, to give an example, and um, thank God. <laughs> and uh, also, I'm incredibly huge fan of uh, Game of Thrones, which I as well uh, downloaded illegally. Now, uh, I uh, opened uh, an account uh, uh, for Netflix specifically to pay because I wanted more Breaking Bad. Just because it was being offered, uh, and it's fantastic, and it felt really good. I can pay, and I can pay my way, and I I don't have to to spend hours. And you know, I was in Costa Rica at the time, and the download speeds of Costa Rica were horrible, and my Netflix was going really well. So I I made that that change. Um, for a Game of Thrones, I bought the books. I Downloaded illegally, but I, I I keep buying as soon as they are available the, the the DVDs, even if I don't watch them. I actually don't 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 even don't even put them in the player. I am buying them because I want more Game of Thrones. I uh, I'm, I'm obsessed, you know. And uh, this is a, a, a conscious decision that, uh, of a consumer that is, uh, and I completely agree with. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is. Uh, where I'm going is that I completely agree that the change has to go, come from the consumer. The consumer makes the, the decision. You know, uh, I want to reward uh, the things that I like, uh, so I, I go out and buy them. But you know, illegal do downloading takes place from time to time as well um, uh, from those informed consumers. And uh, will I be prosecuted for this? Um, we have time for one last question or comment. All right. Um, we're just about on, almost on 4 o'clock. 
So uh, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists here for such a broad and wide-ranging discussion about, about such uh, a complex set of issues. Uh, and to thank you all for coming here this afternoon to share with us. Thanks a lot.